Good evening and welcome. We're pleased to present the second evening with Colin Wilson on science fiction and the esoteric. Colin is the author of 80 books since his first The Outsider in 1956. His most recent book is From Atlantis to the Sphinx, which will be available in this country next year. Uh, this evening's talk will be taped and will be available from Sound Horizons, and you can get that after. Uh, please help me welcome Colin Wilson. again. Okay. <clears throat> Good. Uh, before I begin to talk about um, science fiction and esoteric fiction, I want to state one of the basic ideas of all my work because without this, um, the rest will be incomprehensible. A long time ago, it dawned upon me that we all have inside us a kind of robot which does things for us. So you um, learn to drive a car, <coughs> or learn to use a typewriter or a computer, or you learn to talk French painfully, step by step. And then your robot takes it over and does it more, much more quickly and efficiently than you could do it yourself. The result is that you're able to do things that no animal is capable of doing. Human beings are the most efficient creatures on the surface of the earth. And it's this curious efficiency that gives me so much optimism about the human race. There is one basic problem with a robot. He does all kinds of useful things for you. For example, um, he'll drive your car home when you're very tired and you can't even remember the drive. Uh, moreover, he does things so well that if you try to interfere once he has taken over, then you just screw things up. It's uh, too many cooks spoiling the broth. Uh, for example, if you said to me now, where's the um, brake on an English car? I wouldn't have um, been able to say. But my feet know. This is because the robot is so efficient and it's taken over the driving of my car. The real problem with the robot is that he not only does the things you want him to do, like driving a car and talking foreign languages and so on, he also does the things you don't want him to do. So, you listen to a piece of music that moves you deeply the first few times you hear it. The tenth time you hear it, it's the robot listening instead of you. And you're not really experiencing the music. You go for a walk that you find um, exciting and interesting. The fifth time you go for the same walk, it's the robot walking instead of you. And the experience simply no longer gets through to you. I've even said that I've caught him making love to my wife. And this is one of our basic problems, that the robot is continually taking over the things that we should be doing ourselves. Now, what seems to happen is that the robot cuts in like a thermostat whenever you get slightly tired, and suddenly you find yourself doing things robotically. You could say that basically we're all sort of 50% what you might call real you and 50% what you might call robot. So, you know, there's a kind of 50-50. As soon as you become tired, you suddenly become only 49% real you and 51% the robot. Now, this is the time when you suddenly find, you know, that you can't remember doing things like, you know, driving your car home. If you allow yourself to become 
they tired 52 or 53 percent robots and only 47 percent real you this is a very dangerous situation it's very difficult to get back from it because when you become tired you also go into a kind of negative feedback you see when you're deeply interested in something you put a kind of conviction into doing it which charges your vital batteries in the same way that driving your car charges the car batteries the problem is that when you're doing things on the robot it doesn't charge your batteries or charges them so little that it doesn't really count the result is that it's very easy to feel kind of low and dull inside and very difficult to get out of this once you've fallen into it because when you're low and dull inside you don't put any kind of conviction or drive into your living you feel that things are boring not recognizing that this is a purely subjective state and when things seem to be boring you don't make those efforts that recharge your vital batteries the result is that you feel lower and because you feel lower you don't make those efforts and so it goes on in a kind of vicious circle this means that if human beings got to a certain um, level of depression say you know below let's say 46 percent then you would suddenly find that it was almost impossible to get back again simply because you would be trapped in that vicious circle that negative circle now this means that we need to understand these states if they are not to be extremely dangerous and I realize this is a fairly early stage I once got myself into a state of panic attacks that went on for month after month simply because I was badly overworked I was working so hard that um, I was really driving myself to my limit and uh, I was going sort of pretty well until I got into a state of extreme boredom with some bloody Canadian reporters who came to talk to me and talked non-stop for two days at the end of two days I felt stunned and bewildered like a soldier who'd been subjected to a bombardment and halfway through the night I woke up thinking my god I've got a really hard day's work to do tomorrow and it was really hard I was writing about 5,000 words a day and had to do that seven days a week and uh, then I began to think you know the way that you do in the middle of the night my god I'm not going to manage to do this and I suddenly got the absurd desire to go downstairs right away and start writing and I knew that if I did that I'd really be crazy and so I made a mistake I tried to suppress it by sheer willpower and what then happened was very alarming my face went hot my hands went very hot my heart started beating at a tremendous pace and I leapt out of bed and rushed to the lavatory and just sat on the lavatory trying to soothe myself like a frightened horse and after about half an hour I got cold <clears throat> and gradually the feeling of panic went and I went back to bed but as soon as I got back in bed it started again so I went up to the sitting room and just sat there with the lights on thinking what's the matter with me am, am I having a heart attack and uh, I began to feel sort of tremendously depressed not about my situation but about the world in general for example um, nearby there were lambs in the fields that were making the noises that lambs make and uh, the thought that these sort of poor little devils didn't realize that they were due for the pot suddenly seemed absolutely horrific to me anyway around about five or six in the morning I went back to bed and I succeeded in getting asleep by simply staring at the square of the window and refusing to let myself think in any way just keeping my mind gripped tightly but when I woke up I felt absolutely bloody and uh, what I did was to go downstairs as soon as I got up and write it all down and my account of it was at the beginning of a book called Mysteries that account is substantially what I wrote the following morning anyway I would got into this low state you see of being about 46 percent real me and 54 percent robot and I found it incredibly difficult to get out of 
Um, as the evening approached, I began to feel afraid that the panic attacks would start again. And, of course, the more you're afraid of it, the more they start again. And I'd go to bed, and usually I'd get into bed and put my head on the pillow, and out I go. And instead, no matter how tired I was, I would put my head on the pillow and then begin to think, my God, I hope I'm not going to have a panic attack. And, of course, suddenly you'd feel your hands beginning to warm up in your cheeks, and your heart would begin pounding. And then it was a matter of trying to withdraw from the whole thing trying to withdraw from yourself and leave your body to get on with it. But I finally found the trick. If when I woke up in the middle of the night and began to feel a panic attack coming on, the answer was to wake myself up as fully as I possibly could. And once I was fully wide awake, it could be dealt with. It was while I was trying to fall back to sleep, and while I was half asleep, that the panic attacks were so difficult to deal with. And what I then discovered was very interesting. If I could wake myself up fully enough, I began to experience something that I later called the schoolmistress effect. It was like a schoolmistress walking into a room full of quarrelling children and suddenly <coughs> clapping her hands. And instantly there was a sort of complete silence. Now what I saw was that what I appeared to be doing was, call was calling upon a higher level of me. And clearly this higher level really did exist. And as soon as I made this kind of effort, quite suddenly the schoolmistress clapped her hands and everything went quiet. I really began to find my way out of these panic attacks. About six months later, <clears throat> I was on a train. I'd been in London doing some sort of um, being the chairman at a dinner. And on the train on the way back, quite suddenly, in the middle of the night, I got this feeling of tremendous panic. And uh, it felt so bad that I thought the only thing I could do was to wait for the next stop, wherever it was, and just get off and walk. Luckily, the next stop was a fairly long way off. And during that time, I succeeded in soothing myself back. It's like milk boiling over, trying to come out of a saucepan. Soothing myself back into a state of quietude. And uh, after a while, I realized that if I soothed myself this far, why didn't I try doing it more and more? And so I went on using this same peculiar technique of trying to relax deeply. And quite suddenly, I'd reached a level of relaxation where my heart had almost stopped beating. And I lay there with a curious floating feeling, totally deeply relaxed. When I got home, I did it once again, as I sat in bed drinking tea, put myself into this same state of relaxation, and down I went. And I realized in a certain sense I'd beat it, that I'd learned the solution, and that the solution was this incredibly deep relaxation, which is obviously the same thing as meditation. They didn't go away immediately, but nevertheless, you know, once you're on top of them, the terrifying thing about the panic attacks is that you think they'll win and that you'll end insane or having a heart attack or a, something of the sort. Once you realize that, in fact, you can get on top of them, it's very interesting. You quite suddenly reach a new level of yourself and you realize also that you possess inside yourself a higher level which you haven't yet reached you realize there's a you up there. This is the curious and interesting thing. Aldous Huxley once said that he deeply disagreed with the usual view of the human mind as expounded by Freud, you know, which is sort of condominium with a basement which is full of rats and mice and nasty things. And he went on to point out that the view of um, F. W. H. Myers, who was one of the founders of the Society of Psychical Research, was that it is true we are a kind of ground floor with a basement, but we also have an attic of which we are totally unaware, as real as the basement. And he thought that um, all so-called psychic experiences are due to suddenly getting into that attic and using a higher self which already exists. That there's something else up there so to speak, 
In other words, we are deeply mistaken in our view of what we are. Now, all of this began to come together. And I began to see that in a certain sense, I'd created a sort of basic philosophy, which was the answer to the pessimism which had always worried, always worried me about modern literature, for example. You know, when I was um, about 19, I went to Paris, and the great sensation at that time was a play called En Attendant Godot by Samuel Beckett, which uh, had become the success of the season. And when later I saw Waiting for Godot in London, I felt, although the thing was extremely amusing, deeply irritated with Beckett, simply because he was expressing this view that human life is absolutely pointless. And you remember that in his second um, play, Endgame, two people are simply sitting in dustbins describing how their lives have been absolutely, totally pointless. And so he went on. I mean, his last novel was about somebody who just lies flat in the mud and can't move. <laughs> I always wanted to discuss this with Beckett, and although I met him twice, he wasn't the sort of person that anybody could discuss anything with, because he, as it were, wouldn't defend his position. Anyway, Marilyn Monroe was in the same room, and I was much more interested in her. <laughs> but uh, that feeling that modern literature has a sort of undertone of pessimism was what worried me very much. Because I've always been basically a kind of optimistic character. Sort of as a child, I was, you know, the clever one of the family and the eldest of the family and was admired by sort of grandparents and cousins and this kind of thing. This gives you... A kind of basic feeling of self-confidence. And uh, the result was that when I began studying science and began to realize that I could actually understand things like the theory of relativity when I was about 12, uh, and that nobody else, even the masters at school, couldn't understand it, it does give you that sort of feeling that you're, <laughs> that you're about to go somewhere. In fact, what I thought I was about to become was a second Einstein. I mean, it seemed to me that that was the answer, science, and I became totally obsessed as a result of this by the idea of science, which really just means the idea of knowledge, the idea that human beings can get on top of their condition by knowing about the universe they're living in. Now, when I was 13 or 14, all of this quite suddenly collapsed. And what happened was a little like those later panic attacks. It all started one day in the clay modelling class at school, when we began to talk about the limits of the universe. And I began to talk about Einstein's ideas about space-time and the notion that space is curved and so on. And somebody said, yeah, well, supposing space is curved, and in fact the universe returns upon itself, like some kind of skin of a balloon, what is the balloon suspended in? And then we went on to talk about this notion of where the universe ends and the recognition that even if the universe, as far as the stars were concerned, ended somewhere, apparently there would be space beyond it. And suddenly, I got an awful feeling of terror. The feeling that here suddenly was a real problem to which I did not know the answer, and to which apparently none of the adults I knew knew the answer either. And from then on, I had a sort of awful underlying feeling of uncertainty, and as, you know, adolescence is a difficult time anyway, sort of miserable, tense sort of time, I find myself very often plunged into moods of total nihilism, in which it seemed to me that human life is basically totally futile, that everything we do is purely mechanical, that in fact we are basically little more than machines, penny-in-the-slot machines who react to our environment. And the all I talk about truth and knowledge is a complete delusion. So by the time I was 15 or 16, I'd really been through a sort of fairly bad time. Once during this time, I actually did try to commit suicide. I got the feeling that life was a sort of stupid treadmill that you just could not win. Uh, by this time, I'd left school and gone back at the age of 16 as a laboratory assistant. 
And uh, it was a job I disliked on the whole. It bored me. And the physics master disliked me, and I disliked the physics master. I would find by that time that um, poetry suddenly gave me a feeling of release. And I'd go home in the evening feeling completely exhausted and bored and miserable and then read poetry for the whole evening, starting off with incredibly depressive stuff like The Waste Land and the poems of Edgar Allan Poe. And gradually, as it went on, I get more and more cheerful until finally I was reading things like Mills L'Allegro and the poems of Herrick and uh, feeling curiously strong. This always happened. It was a feeling of floating getting up above the normal problems of human existence. But then the next day there would come work again and boredom and so on, and I'd find myself back at the bottom again, having assured myself that life was absolutely wonderful and that I had nothing to complain about. Once again, this feeling of deep depression and exhaustion and the feeling that it was a miserable treadmill and that I was sort of like a mouse just running round and round on it. And one day, as I was writing this down in my diary, it suddenly struck me that it seemed to me that God was a kind of confidence trickster who persuades us to make tremendous efforts all to no purpose whatsoever. And the end is simply death. And that life in itself is really not worth the effort. And suddenly I thought, I'll kill myself. And as soon as I thought that, I felt immensely cheerful. I thought, you know, I'll get my own back on God. <laughs> I'll prove to him <laughs> that I refuse to play the game. And I went along to the analytical chemistry class that evening and got in late. And I knew what I was going to do. I went over to the reagent shelves while all the other students were gathered around the professor standing at the table. I took down the bottle of potassium cyanide and uncorked it. And I knew that potassium cyanide kills you within a matter of seconds. It combines with the hydrochloric acid in your stomach to form hydrocyanic acid, which is instantly absorbed by the system and just simply kills you instantly. And as I raised this to my mouth and smelt this sort of bitter almond smell, a peculiar thing happened. I suddenly became two people. One of them was this sort of miserable, self-pitying little idiot called Colin Wilson who was about to kill himself, and the other one was me. And I didn't give a damn whether he killed himself or not. But on the other hand, if he did, he'd kill me too. And quite suddenly, I saw the whole thing was absurd and re the bottle and put it back on the shelf and experienced an overwhelming sense of sheer happiness and delight. And this lasted for three or four days, a curious underlying feeling that everything was totally good. That fi finally went away, but even so I could see that killing myself was simply no answer. But also I was fascinated by this glimpse that I was two people and that one of them was quite above all my problems and didn't care about them in the least. Now, what struck me about modern literature was that, for the most part, the serious writers all seem to assume that you could not win. And I don't just mean modern writers like Samuel Beckett and Graham Greene and Sartre and Camus and so on. I mean writers dating right back to the beginning of the century that what had happened was that, first of all, at the beginning of the 19th century, you got a tremendous feeling of optimism in certain people, like, for example, um, Schiller and Goethe and Wordsworth and Coleridge and so on, the feeling that man's capable of mystical experiences that raise him above the level of the ordinary. Hoffman was one of my favourite writers at this time. And then, suddenly, people began to feel that you cannot win. And as the 19th century progresses the writers get more and more gloomy and the rate of death from suicide or stupid accidents like Shelley's drowning become more and more frequent <clears throat> until towards the end of the century in the 1890s you suddenly got a feeling of total depression the feeling that you just cannot win Ernest Dowson wrote in a poem the fire is out and spent the warmth thereof this is the end of every song man sings and to those writers of the 1890s, it really did seem that life was a sort of unpleasant delusion. At his best, Dowson felt a sort of feeling 
of relaxation and reconciliation, you know, out of a misty dream, our life emerges for a while, then closes within a dream. But for the most part, they felt totally miserable and depressed. And the result was that all serious literature from that time onwards seemed to make this assumption that you could not win. If you wanted to read literature that was about people who won, you had to read <laughs> novels of, like The 39 Steps of John Buchan, or, you know, later on Ian Fleming's James Bond, or Superman or something of the sort. But in serious literature, the hero was always finally defeated. Uh, this applies, of course, particularly to um, the Russians. But uh, I was always fascinated by a novel by a man called Artsy Bashev, who actually began his career by writing a wonderful novel called Sanin, in which the hero decides that all in incentives of morality and all the rest of it are complete nonsense. And uh, the novel has a wonderful, explosive sort of feeling and became deservedly a bestseller around about 1908. A few years later, in 1912, he wrote a novel called Breaking Point, which is about some tiny Russian town on a step where everything is dull and boring. And at the end of the novel, all of the major characters commit suicide. The Nazi Bashev obviously felt that this was a sensible response to life, committing suicide. Uh, I'm glad to say that his career went downhill after that. And uh, in the revolution, he was regarded as very much persona non grata. But that feeling that life is simply not worthwhile, you'll find running throughout all sort of more or less serious literature around the beginning of this century. And of course, um, you also have something like, say, Ulysses, where Joyce assumes that he's kind of outsider hero is going to be permanently an outsider. That his, you remember Stephen Dedalus saying that the answer is, is simply um, silence, exile, and cunning. That there's no chance of being reconciled by, with this society. Thomas Mann, of course, loved this kind of equation in which the healthy people are always stupid and it's the artists and so on, the unhealthy, intelligent people <coughs> who nevertheless die young. The feeling that health um, is another name for vitality, um, explosive interest in life, and yet at the same time um, for sheer moronic stupidity. Now, that kind of feeling somehow struck me as fundamentally wrong. All my instincts were against it. And what seemed equally obvious was that the instincts of most of my contemporaries in the 1950s were in nowhere against it. They accepted it completely. If you wrote serious literature, then the hero was always defeated. And in those early days during my teens, it seemed to me that there was only one form of literature in which this was not the common assumption. And this was science fiction. I discovered science fiction when I was about 10 years old, when some uh, relative presented me with an ancient science fiction magazine without any covers. And I found this completely and totally absorbing. Uh, one of the stories was about a scientist inventing some form of fire that would consume absolutely anything. And, of course, somebody drops a vial of this stuff and it ends by consuming most of the world before they find a way of putting it out. Uh, another of these stories was about a scientist who invents a kind of protoplasm which can absorb absolutely anything and eat it up. And then it accidentally gets washed down the sink into the sea and ends by eating most of the fish and coming up and engulfing ocean liners. <laughs> and, uh, but what struck me as so interesting about all this was the intelligence behind it that these people were writing about serious intelligent issues, the kind of issues that fascinated me so much, and yet at the same time were able to write stuff that was not like Ulysses, completely static. And so from a very early stage I got the feeling that, you know, there was a kind of answer 
in science fiction. But what also struck me very strongly was that all of the science fiction of that period was fundamentally pessimistic. If you read novels like um, H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds, it seems, you know, that all this business of people coming from another planet and landing on the surface of the Earth, the purpose is not to teach human beings something about the universe, but merely to kill them off. And the Martians are only killed off by accident. In a novel called The Food of the Gods, somebody discovers a food that causes people to expand until they become giants. But all that happens is that the rest of the human race cannot stand the giants and tries to murder them all until they remove themselves and try to create a separate civilization. Wells, like all of the others, was basically very pessimistic. And it seemed to me that there's got to be a way out of this basic pessimism. In um, The Old Man and the Sea, which you remember is about an, a fisherman catching an enormous fish which gets eaten by sharks before he can get back to, back to port, Hemingway said, a man can be destroyed but not defeated. Well, that sounds marvellous, except, you know, that in a sense the unfortunate fisherman is defeated. My feeling was that surely there must be a possibility of human beings not being either defeated or destroyed. This is what I wanted to do. Well, in the early 1960s, I came to America for the first time. And I'd already discovered the novels of H.P. Lovecraft by accident and sent off to Arkham House in Wisconsin uh, for copies of everything that Lovecraft had written. Lovecraft, again, was a totally pessimistic writer. But this fascinated me because he'd found his pessimism extremely difficult to maintain. What had happened is that he'd started off with stories like The Call of Cthulhu in which he said that one of the most blessed things is the inability of the human mind to see things as a whole, because if we did, we'd curl up and die with horror. And, uh, you know, all of his stories are based upon this same notion, that in fact, uh, all notions about uh, the benevolence of the universe are total nonsense. The universe is absolutely indifferent to human beings, and uh, if we could only face up to this fact, We'd be certainly more honest, but definitely not happier. Now, what happened to Lovecraft? You know that he was this kind of hermit who lived in Providence, Rose, uh, Rhode Island. Uh, wrote these stories for things like weird tales. And they just never made an impact. And poor old Lovecraft continued to produce these they're quite extraordinary stories. They are, in a way, real literature, although they tend to be very badly written. And then, towards the end of his career, began writing odd stories with um, titles like The Colour Out of Space and The Shadow Out of Time. And what had happened is that he began to write about the much bigger universe and about the idea of giant eons of time. And suddenly he became a very good science fiction writer in those stories. And he found to his horror and disgust that it was making him cheerful. <laughs> Lovecraft died because he saw that in a certain sense his whole life had been a false direction. That in that early work, with his obsessive feeling of horror and misery, he hadn't really been going anywhere. And now quite suddenly he was writing these extremely interesting stories in which he seemed to see the universe from a genuinely detached viewpoint and realized that this meant that all of this sort of early horror was just kids' stuff, totally immature. You see, I'd always recognize that one of the problems with pessimism is that when we get terribly tired, we see life from a kind of worm's eye view. It's rather as if you'd fallen asleep with a bad hangover under a chair, and then you wake up and you see something sort of looming up above you, and think, you know, what is that? But this weird point of view is simply due to the fact that, you know, you have got a hangover and you've fallen asleep under a chair. If, in fact, you're feeling perfectly normal, you get up and sit on the chair, and suddenly you're in charge of your own existence. 
And that was really the great basic question. How far human beings are in charge of their own existence. Now, <clears throat> having been through this period of total pessimism and nihilism, I had a very, very deep feeling that no matter how bad life gets, human beings are capable of getting on top of their problems. And this was one of my deepest convictions. And then I began to recognise what I've been explaining, the robot. And that one of our most basic problems is the robot. Because when you get tired, the robot takes over and suddenly everything looks miserable and rotten and pointless. There's a scene in Ulysses where Mr. Bloom goes into some pub at lunchtime to um, eat his lunch and drink a beer. And looking around at these people swilling down on food and gobbling it down, he suddenly feels absolutely totally revolted and nauseated and uh, hastily leaves. Now, it seemed to me perfectly obvious that all that was happening was that he was tired. And when you are tired, for example, noise seems meaningless. You notice that when you're on the point of sleep, if there's a noise going on around you, suddenly you seem to be existing in a kind of meaningless world in which there's nothing but noise. Whenever we're tired, the robot takes over and life becomes meaningless. Sartre began his career by writing a novel in the 1930s called Nausea, in which the central character is writing a history of a 17th century diplomat and suddenly feels that the whole thing is a lie, that real people's lives cannot be written because you go on from minute to minute, second to second, and that all of this stuff about some great curve of meaning is untrue. And all this comes to a head when he's sitting in the park, looking at the roots of a tree, and suddenly he experiences a peculiar feeling of horror. It's almost as if the tree had turned into a kind of octopus. But what he's really feeling is that existence is so real that it negates us. And this was Sartre's basic idea, this feeling that human life is meaningless. He ended his magnum opus, this book, um, Being and Nothingness, with the comment, it is meaningless that we live and meaningless that we die. Man is a useless passion. Now, it struck me that this is absurd. This is Mr. Bloom feeling sick is understandable. All that he's done is to let himself go. So, and as soon as you let yourself go, your robot takes over. And as soon as your robot takes over, this sort of eager desire to absorb things disappears. In the same way, when you're feeling very low, you cease to feel hungry because your stomach can't arouse the interest to absorb food. And life is a continuous process of absorption. Absor absorption of facts from the environment. The philosopher Whitehead called it prehension. It's kind of eating of your experience. As soon as you get low and the robot takes over, you cease to eat your experience. And suddenly you get that appalling feeling of misery. Now, I had, in a sense, solved this already with the schoolmistress effect. In the middle of the night, you were naturally low. Make any kind of effort to drag yourself out of that robotic level, and what you've done is to shove yourself up to at least 50-50. 50% real you and 50% robot. And as soon as you do that, you become normal once again. That's why it suddenly seemed to me that the only way in which one could say this kind of thing was not only in fiction, but in science fiction. August Derleth, who ran Arkham House in Sork City, read a book of mine called The Strength of the Dream, in which I'd said some rather harsh things about Lovecraft's appalling style, and said, well, if you're going to do any better, why don't you write it and I'll publish it? And so I decided I would try to do that. 
I wrote a novel called The Mind Parasites. The basic plot of The Mind Parasites is fairly simple. Uh, people start committing suicide and the central character realises that the reason they're committing suicide is that some peculiar parasite has actually got inside the human psyche and is draining away its energy. And that this parasite has been doing that for the past two or three centuries. That this is the reason that the romantics continually experience these moods of ecstasy followed by moods of deep depression. The purpose of the parasites um, is to try to encourage us to feel ecstasy and then to take away the energy that we've created. In other words, that in a sense we are cattle who are being sucked dry by sort of energy vampires. And of course the interesting question for me in The Mind Parasites was, if you had this kind of parasite inside your head, how could you possibly fight it? Because it would already know everything you intended to do before you did it. But the solution was fairly obvious. You don't fight against problems by deliberately thinking about how you can solve them. You fight out of a kind of inner certainty that rises from the depths of you in certain moments of optimism, what G.K. Chesterton called absurd good news. And it seemed to me that this was the basic problem. How can human beings create a sense of absurd, absurd good news spontaneously. In the mind parasites, I frankly did not try to solve the problem, I merely stated it. And as I read the novel, it now seems to me that the most unsuccessful part is the last part of it. But I'd already begun to see the answer through correspondence with the psychologist Abraham Maslow who had written to me in the 1950s saying that as a psychologist he had decided to stop studying sick people because sick people talked about nothing but their sickness. And he had decided to study the healthiest specimens he could find. And as you know, because he decided to do something that nobody else had tried to do, he immediately discovered something quite extraordinary. That all the healthy people he studied experienced with great frequency what he called peak experiences. These experiences of sudden bubbling, overwhelming happiness. And the peak experience was not any, in any way a mystical experience. It was just that sudden feeling of what Chesterton calls absurd good news. It seemed to me that one of the most interesting examples that Maslow cited was the case of a sailor who had been in the Pacific for several years without ever seeing a woman. When he came back to base, he saw a nurse and had a peak experience because, he said, it suddenly hit him that women are different from men. He said, we take it for granted that women are different from men. We said, yeah, of course they are. But we don't realize it. We don't mean it. And seeing a nurse for the first time in four years, he could see it and suddenly mean it totally, that they're as different from men as horses are from cows, that they're two different species. And this sudden perception of difference causes the peak experience. It's this sudden overwhelming sense that the world is far, far more interesting and complex than you thought. Now, when you're feeling tired and miserable, the thought that the world is far more complex than you thought merely causes a sinking in the pit of your stomach and a desire to turn your back on it. When you're feeling healthy, the notion that the world is complex on the contrary, raises a tremendous sense of optimism and drive. Now, what interested me so much about Maslow, particularly when I went to see him at Brandeis University, was his feeling that human beings are fundamentally extremely healthy creatures who can do far more interesting things than they themselves realise. And he told me how, talking to his students about peak experiences, the students began to remember peak experiences which they'd had in the past and had now forgotten. But as soon as they began to talk about peak experiences, they remembered all kinds of, of peak experiences. And as soon as they began to talk to one another, was the basic answer.
if, in fact, simply using your mind to turn in that direction can give you this overwhelming sense that the universe is worthwhile, then it's obviously far more simple than we thought it was. The real and interesting question was the question, how can we produce peak experiences at will? Now, it was at that point that I recalled this story about Graham Greene, which I've told a thousand times and I'm going to tell again, that when Greene was a teenager um, at a school at Berkhamstead, of which his, head, his father was headmaster, he went into a deep condition of boredom and depression. And that during this state, <clears throat> he was sent along to see a psychiatrist who kept him in his house for about six months, gave him a sense of being, as it were, really um, attended to and loved. But that when he left, he had no neuroses at all, but was totally bored. He said that it was, he was in a condition in which he could see visually when something was beautiful, but inside him he felt nothing, nothing whatsoever, a sort of dead grayness. And that during this time he found his brother's revolver in a cupboard, took it out under Berkhamstead Common and played Russian roulette, put one bullet in the chamber, spun the chambers, pointed it at his head and pulled the trigger. And when there was just a click, he looked down the barrel and saw that the bullet had now come into position. And he said he felt an overwhelming feeling of absolute sheer delight and a sudden feeling that the universe is wonderful. And he went on and did that several more times until even that got boring. Now clearly, what Green had done was quite interesting. He'd been in a state of boredom which meant that his robot was living his life for him which meant that he was not recharging his vital batteries, and they were always flat, and therefore everything looked dead and dull and grey. As soon as he picked up the gun and pointed at his head, this prospect of immediate extinction caused him to go so to speak, Ugh! Then there was just a click and he went, Phew! with an enormous feeling of relaxation and relief, which was like the kind of stuff I achieved on the train, by deliberately causing myself to relax. And in these states of relaxation, we suddenly have this overwhelming feeling that life is worthwhile and that any kind of effort brings results. And it was then that I began to see that I'd, be, I'd got a kind of an answer, that the peak experience is caused by intense concentration followed by total relaxation. In other words, what you were doing is concentrating your full attention like that until it's reached a point where you can no, lo no longer hold it like that and you go, Phew. and when you let yourself relax deeply, quite suddenly, you induce the peak experience. Now, as soon as I got that mechanism of the peak experience, I began trying it. And what I did originally was simply try, con try concentrating my mind intently for as long as I could bear it and then letting it relax and then concentrating again and then letting it relax. An easy way of doing this was to hold up a pen against a wall and concentrate on the pen until you see nothing but the pen and then relax and open up and then concentrate again and then relax and open up. And I quickly discovered that when you've done that about ten times really trying it makes you sweat, and it also makes you hurt behind the eyes. And I realized that if I then pushed myself on, I always went through to the peak experience. It was a matter of almost a kind of pumping action that gradually pumped up the vitality. You see, each time you concentrate hard, you are turning off the robot. But you perhaps don't do it very efficiently. You only turn off, you know, the robot one quarter. But if you continue to do it again and again and again, you gradually get into it. And as you gradually get into it, then quite suddenly, the real you takes over. And you suddenly find that you're in charge 
of your own emotions, of your own mind. It's a pity, in a way, you know, that I, I can't, that we haven't got some cushions here and I could make you all lie down on the floor and actually try this. You see, what you are doing when you experience that feeling of inner intensity is recognizing your own freedom. The robot gives you a feeling that you are not free. And if you're feeling tired and miserable and you walk out into the street outside with its crowds and its traffic, you automatically experience a kind, of, a kind of sinking feeling which makes you less free than ever. What you have to do is to seize onto that freedom when it comes. You notice that when you're setting out on a holiday, you get that curious feeling of sudden interest in your environment. Everything is interesting as you look out of the window of the train or the window of the car. Moreover, you get the feeling that that interest is rather like the thing that you get with alcohol, a kind of lift that gives you a feeling that there are even greater areas of interest which lie outside what you are looking at. And little by little, you can actually push yourself into an intenser state of consciousness. Look, when you, when you get home, try this. Lie down on the floor with a cushion under your head and place yourself deliberately in a state of relaxation. The first thing you notice when you lie down on the floor with the cushion under your head is this curious feeling of the ache in your body beginning to drain away. Pay attention to your sort of muscles and your skin. You can actually feel that relief. Now, if you pay attention to your muscles and your skin, you notice in particular parts you feel more relieved, so to speak, than in others. Notice this too, that when you pay attention to those parts of your body where, so to speak, you are feeling more relieved than elsewhere, you actually intensify the feeling of relief. You know the way that talking about itching makes you scratch? Or the way that talking about coughing makes people cough? In the same sort of way, when you focus upon these areas of your body lying on the floor, it's like trying to see those splotches inside your eyes that you get if you rub your eyes vigorously and colours begin to float around in patches. Well, try looking at those patches and of course you can't because they're inside your eyelid and all that happens is the patches change shape and sometimes change colour and you can change them into almost anything you like. It's this peculiar power to make these patches change shape that makes you realize that there's something inside your head which molds them as a sculptor molds clay. Now, as you lie on the floor with your eyes closed, you can notice the same thing with your body. When you try to focus on any feeling of relaxation, energy, it changes because your mind somehow interferes it's like a beam of light suddenly shining through a room full of smoke and seeming to make the smoke swirl more strongly than before. What you are ex experiencing in these states is freedom. It's the recognition that you are capable of causing this kind of change. A few years ago, I got a letter from a doctor called Howard Miller, who lived in New Jersey. And Miller said in this letter that he had come to the conclusion that the main problem with human beings is that they consider themselves to be sort of mechanical. And the result is that they don't, they don't make any real efforts. Now Miller had had a patient uh, who was terrified of having a teeth um, pulled or drilled or anything of the sort and one day Miller saw an advertisement in a newspaper for a hypnotist so he took the patient along to see the hypnotist and the hypnotist was very good within a few moments he got this woman um, completely in a trance and he said to the woman okay when I pull your teeth it's not going to hurt and then to Miller's amazement he said and what's more you will not bleed and Miller thought oh that's preposterous 
you can tell her that it won't hurt, but you can't tell her not to bleed. But the dentist pulled the teeth, and she did not bleed. And Miller realised that there's something in us which has a curious control and power over the body itself. And he was so fascinated by this that he began using it on his patients in an attempt to control cancers. And although he didn't actually cure anybody of cancer, he was able, through hypnosis, to secure long remissions. Now what Miller wanted to know was why? What is there inside us that does this? He came to the conclusion that we possess, so to speak, a kind of control unit, which he called the unit of pure thought. But in fact, the control unit is really you, the essential you, the real you, as com compared with the robot. And that when you are doing something with the real you, you can do the most astonishing things. He says, look, it's like sitting in a cinema and watching a film which is obviously, you know, it's distorted. Uh, you keep getting flashes of light and across the screen and you think, my God, what the hell is the project projectionist doing? And finally you get so fed up, you go up to the projection box and it's empty. Then suddenly you remember, you are the projectionist. That's the reason you're getting such awful results. It's exactly in a way like somebody driving the car sitting in the passenger seat and having to reach over and turn the steering wheel from the passenger seat. It just does not work. What happened with Graham Greene when he pointed the gun at his head and there was just a click was that he kind of gave a shriek and leapt into the driver's seat. And as soon as you're in the driver's seat it's perfectly easy to drive the car. Human beings spend their lives in the passenger seat and this is our basic problem. Any kind of mental effort, you know, particularly serious mental effort, like pointing a gun at your head and pulling the trigger, makes you jump out of the passenger seat and into the driver's seat. But on the whole, this is a fairly dangerous way of doing it. And there are much more simple ways of doing it. And the simplest way is to make any kind of continuous mental effort because within seconds you've kind of warmed up. You'll find that if you try this technique of just lying on the ground and focusing upon those nodes of energy swirling around your body and recognizing how far you can change them, you get an odd feeling which is rather like being in an aeroplane coming in over a city at night. Your whole body seems to be made of great long roads with lights on either side of them. And then if you simply make a kind of effort, you recognize that it's quite easy to see that you are not the city. That there's a distinction between you and your body. You recognize this by concentrating upon these nodes of energy and seeing the way they change. And as soon as you've done that, you can do the most interesting things. For example, once you recognize that you are not your body, you can focus, so to speak, upon yourself lying there inside your body. And you can actually lift yourself, so to speak, above your backbone, imagining very clearly that the front of you is coming above the front of your body. And you can actually do that with such clarity that you can feel yourself lifting out of your body and going back. All kinds of interesting things are possible once you actually recognize this. Miller said, look, supposing you're lying on um, a warm beach on a hot day, close your eyes and imagine that you're lying there on the sand and you can hear the sea splashing on the beach, that you can sort of feel the wind against your cheeks and so on. Now suddenly imagine that you're on a hillside on a freezing cold day and you're standing there with skis on in the snow and that the branches of the trees above you are loaded with snow and that the wind is cold. It's very easy to do this. Miller said, yes, but what in you transferred you from that warm beach to that snowy hillside? 
If you focus upon that, you suddenly recognize that you are the projectionist. Now, this is the basic answer to the problem I raised in The Mind Parasites, because you can see that The Mind Parasites is basically simply a parable about the fact that we can be so easily drawn into negative feedback, and that once you've been drawn into it, it's incredibly difficult to get out of it. The answer, clearly, is this recognition that you are in charge. But it's extremely difficult to keep this recognition for any length of time without, so to speak, grasping it as a concept, not just as a feeling, not just waiting until you're feeling good, or even allowing yourself to try these exercises of lying on the floor and gradually beginning to feel it. You've got to know it with your intellect, with your mind. And once you know it with your mind, you're already more than halfway there. H.G. Wells wrote an interesting story towards the end of his life called The Croquet Player. It was about a, about a man in a small hotel who gets very interested in one of the fellow guests. This fellow guest is there in order to relax and unwind. And when he talks to him, the fellow guest has an incredible story. He explains that he's been living in East Anglia and that he noticed extremely nasty things happening in the district. A dog beaten to death lying in a ditch, um, a man who's murdered his wife under peculiar circumstances and so on. And that he's come to the conclusion that the real trouble is that the archaeologists digging up the bones of ancient cavemen have somehow released a kind of violence into the atmosphere which is soaking into people and making them violent. And the croquet player, who is the man in the hotel, is fascinated by this story. And then the man's own doctor comes to the hotel and the croquet player says to him, this is a most incredible story. Um, is it really true? And the doctor says, of course it's not true. The problem with him is that he simply let the world get him down to such an extent that he needs to feel a kind of objective reason for finding the world so miserable and depressing. And so what he's done is to invent this story about the cavemen causing all of these problems in East Anglia. He says, indeed, there are these problems, and indeed, archaeologists are digging up cavemen. But basically, that's not the real problem. The problem is that he has decided that he is defeated by his own life, by the sheer complexity of civilization. And the doctor then goes on to say, somehow we've got to cease to do this, we've got to become so strong that we are no longer defeated by our own lives, by the sheer complexity and misery of modern civilization. It may look absolutely rotten, it may seem to be filled with all kinds of miseries, and the 20th century may seem to be the most violent and unpleasant century that there ever has been. In fact, that's by no means true. There have been plenty of other centuries that have been far more violent. But the fact remains that this does not prove the world is going downhill, because you contain the basic essence of freedom. You contain what we're talking about. The fact that in certain moments you can, by the deliberate exercise of your mind, suddenly recognize that you are free. Now, what I'm actually saying is in a sense a contradiction of the whole course of modern culture over the past two centuries. We have become so totally convinced that the modern world is an appallingly complex place, that we've lost the ability, so to speak, to swim against the tide, or we seem to have lost the ability to swim against the tide. In point of fact, as soon as you begin to recognize that mere focused concentration in itself is the first important step, as soon as you begin to recognize that, you've already begun to undermine this whole what I call the fallacy of insignificance, the feeling that modern man cannot do anything. You see, we appear to possess all kinds of peculiar powers that we don't even begin to understand. I talked about this last night to some extent. 
that I'd become so interested in the occult because people suddenly discover that they are able, for example, to get a clear picture of something which is happening elsewhere. Not only that, we seem in some strange way to be able to influence the course of events. When I started writing The Occult, I thought that the people I ought to talk to should be poets and artists because they were most likely to have had some kind of paranormal experience and indeed this proved to be totally true. I talked for example to the historian A. L. Rouse um, who's also a very good poet. Rouse told me how once he was looking out of the window in his Oxford quadrangle and he realised that this was enormously heavy and if the window fell it would chop off his head and he was feeling so irritable he said oh let the damn thing fall then as he pulled in his head, the window went zoomp. <laughs> now, it was almost as if something was trying to teach him something. That he would have deeply regretted it if it really had fallen. And I found exactly the same kind of thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was driving back from the pub on a Saturday night. I always go to the pub on a Saturday evening for an early bottle of wine and plate of sandwiches. And I was talking to my wife about the fact that we take it absolutely for granted that, you know, we are going to get home and have supper and sort of watch television and fall asleep. And that, really, this is a mistaken assumption. I said, you know, this car, which seems perfectly reliable, might well break down at this very moment. And as I said that, the car went slower and slower and slower and stopped. Well, we got out, we lifted up the bonnet. There seemed to be nothing obviously wrong with it. We tried everything to get the damn thing started, and it would not start. And then another car came along, and I flagged it down and said, look, would you mind dropping my wife at the next village? And um, luckily, we got a great uh, bundle of rope in the back of the car, and she came back with a Land Rover, but without rope. We roped up the car to the Land Rover, drove off home, and were home only about 20 minutes late. But this struck me as very significant. It was almost as if some fate, as I said, we take it for granted this car will take us home, was trying to show me something and saying, now pay attention. Don't assume the world is meaningless. Something interesting is happening. Now, on the few occasions when I've really tried to pay attention in that way, the result has been most interesting. I describe in a book called Beyond the Occult, which I consider to be my best book, how... On one occasion in 1979, I'd spent a couple of days lecturing at some place in Devon over the new year, and suddenly it began to snow, and it snowed so heavily that we were completely snowed in. The place was on a kind of farm in the middle of nowhere, and when we woke up, the snow was piled up through our windows. Well, we stuck it for 24 hours, unable to get out, and on the second day, a few of us decided we'd really got to get out of this thing. And we all tried our, to get our cars out of the farmyard, which was at the bottom of a slope. None of the cars would go up the slope, except for some odd reason mine, and the tyres did bite into the snow and actually got me to the top of the slope. We then all pushed like mad behind the car, grabbed shovels and shoveled in front of it, and the main road was something like half a mile away, and we shoveled frantically all morning until we finally got my car to the main road, and obviously the other cars could also do this. Then I went back, to the place and had some lunch, tramped all the way back to the car, I got in the car and proceeded to drive home. But at this point I found that it wasn't as easy as I'd expected because the road, <coughs> the road was almost completely invisible. The snow was piled up on either side and of course under that was the ditch. And you couldn't see where the ditch was or really where the middle of the road was. What I was forced to do was to drive at something like 10 or 15 miles an hour watching intently, because I realised that if I went off the road and landed in the ditch, there'd be no chance of getting out of the ditch, and then I might well be frozen to death by the following morning. I concentrated like mad, <clears throat> and I drove for something like an hour in the state of concentration before finally we came out onto the main road. And as soon as I was on the main road, first of all this feeling of happiness and relaxation, and then I realised that the sheer concentration that I'd brought to driving for the past hour had become fixed. It had, in other words, been taken over by the robot itself. And everything I looked at was 
deeply interesting. Everything seemed fascinating. And all the way home, I experienced this state of tremendous intensity and knew that this is what human consciousness is supposed to be, or at least is a good first step towards it. And that I'd simply done it because I was in this situation where I could have landed in the ditch and spent the night there. I've done that on just two other occasions. And on both these occasions I did the same kind of thing. A long period of intense focused concentration which has brought me into this curious state of inner strength as if the brain is like a hand which is capable of closing and grasping. Instead of merely being a passive instrument that sort of views the world like a mirror, it becomes an instrument for transforming the body and the mind. The brain itself seems to become a kind of muscle. Now, that has given me a very clear idea <coughs> of the answer to this problem of human evolution at the moment. We've become too passive. Human beings have created the most complex and superb civilization which has ever been known on the surface of this earth. And yet we're not particularly happy in it. Why are we not particularly happy? <laughs> because we spend most of our time in a robotic state in which we don't appreciate what we've created. I can remember during the war as a child, I was nine when the war started in 1940, that the threat of being invaded by the Nazis produced a peculiar kind of exaltation. I've never seen people so happy as during the war. Sartre once said that he'd never felt so free as when he was in the French resistance and was likely to be arrested and shot at any moment. And I saw the same thing during the war. We thought that when the end of the war comes we shall be so ecstatically happy just to be free. And of course it didn't happen. The end of the war brought a sort of curious anticlimax. And within months everybody was just as bored as before. Afterwards, I met a German girl who'd been in the Hitler Youth. And I said, how could you be in an organization like the Hitler Youth? And she said, <coughs> it was the greatest period of my life. She said, I've never been so ecstatically happy. And I've never been so bored as after the war, how there's no longer any kind of purpose. She once got so angry with the traffic in London that on a kind of dare from me, she went and got into the middle of Westminster Bridge and proceeded to sort of do salams, bashing her head against the pavement, and held up all the traffic. This obviously gave her some kind of feeling of what it was like to be in the Hitler Youth, and to do something simply on impulse, a kind of violent determination. But I could also see that she might just as easily have smashed something. She might have picked up something heavy and thrown it through the windscreen of a car. It's a kind of desperation which comes from being passive, and what I'm trying to say is that the passivity is absolutely unnecessary. What we have to do is to recognize that the source of passivity is our notion that we are robots. And that as soon as you can focus upon the fact that you are basically free, that disappears and everything changes. That's why I believe that the human race is on the point of an evolutionary leap to a higher stage. I believe we're all going to recognize this and that we should automatically control our lives far more fully than ever before. I'm going to stop. And take a break? Uh, nope. If anybody wants to ask questions. Questions? I'm, and, uh, um, I'm interested why you uh, titled the evening uh, Science Fiction and the Esoteric. Uh, I meant to bring in a lot more of Science Fiction and the Esoteric than actually I did. <laughs> uh, one thing I did mean to <coughs> bring in, though, which is very relevant to this, was the fact that Alistair Crowley, early in his career, became fascinated by a book called The Cloud Upon the Sanctuary by some German mystic called, I think, Ebbinghausen. Spent a long time getting hold of this book and then read it again and again and again. And it influenced his whole career. This notion that somewhere there was a kind of monastery 
in which people really knew the secret of human existence and were able to teach it to other people. And it seemed to me that this has always been the secret of so-called esoteric fiction, this notion that there is some place, some Shangri-La, some monastery where they know the secret of human existence and where they would actually able to pass it on to the rest of the human race. Now, this seems to me to be the perfect example of what I've been talking about, this fallacy of insignificance. The whole of esoteric fiction is based upon this notion that we ourselves need some sort of saviour from outside. And Crowley, it seems to me, led a completely wasted life merely because he started off with this idea to look for some kind of saviour from outside. Now, what I've been trying to say, and I agree I haven't brought in as much science fiction as I'd intended to, what I'm trying to say is that somehow science fiction has to learn to express this, and it's the most difficult thing so far, that it's got to learn to express this recognition that we don't need a saviour from outside. That in fact, unless we save ourselves, we're not saved. Well, I mean, wh what you've really said is a version of a question um, that I've usually experienced when I've been talking about this, and that is people saying, if you had peak experiences all the time, wouldn't they become plateau experiences? And the answer to that is obviously no. When you experience freedom, um, it's quite unlike anything else you experience. Now, I can see your point that once you're in peak experiences, and you begin thinking about them and wondering how you can intensify them, they do tend to disappear. But on the other hand, once you've learned this trick of getting yourself into the peak experience, you see, it's like sort of um, sexual excitement, which can fairly easily be dissipated, you know, if there's a loud bang on the door or something of the sort. And also, of course, can be dissipated um, by your own self-consciousness. And yet, nevertheless, as we all know, there occur at times certain states of sexual excitement which absolutely nothing dissipates because in a peculiar kind of sense you are now in control. And this seems to me to be the answer to that question. Push yourself further and further, recognizing that it's not a passive business. What you are trying to do is not to walk out in the street and appreciate the stars or the street lamps. What you do is actually to concentrate and focus. It's that attention. You know, I love telling that Zen story of somebody saying to the Zen master Ikkyu, will you write something significant upon my tablet? And he writes, attention. And the workman says, oh, come on. Something more significant than that. So he writes, attention, attention. And he says, oh, please. And he writes, attention, attention, attention. And finally, the man says in exasperation, what does attention mean? And Ikkyu says, attention means attention. Now, once you actually grasp that fact, that it's the attention itself, and that what it creates is that curious feeling of being in control, in charge, and that as soon as you get the feeling of being in control and in charge, your vital batteries begin to charge up. 
and quite suddenly, within five minutes, you can be completely out of a state of misery and depression. It's a trick, and the trick depends upon knowing that you can do it. Now the question is, um, there are religions and cultures that don't regard self-control as the highest value, and that, for example, in voodoo, you may attempt to be possessed, taken over by something outside yourself, and that, and the same applies, of course, to the Greek religion of Dionysus, and that also in Taoism, there's an attempt simply, as it were, to blend with something and to go with it. Now, that seems to me to be extremely important and very true, but, nevertheless, it can all be taken in within what I've been saying. I'm not contradicting Taoism. On the contrary, it seems to me that what I experienced on that train coming back was a deep enough relaxation to suddenly begin feeling meanings flowing through me. I was going with the meanings. And I'd done that not by an attempt at self-control, but by relaxing below self-control. It was almost as if I'd gone into the, gone into the basement the engine room of my own being and could see the other things going on up above me while I was below them. Um, as to the Dionysian sort of ecstasy, that is basically, simply, an intense state of self-control. I mean, Crowley regarded um, sex as the most important of the disciplines and practiced various kinds of tantric yoga simply because he recognized that in the sexual orgasm you achieve an extremely high degree of self-control that just lasts a few seconds. And, of course, the aim of tantrism is to attempt to achieve that for more than a few seconds. That all seems to be very interesting, but unless you recognize what I've been saying, that is, that our modern civilization has placed us in a position where we feel permanently passive, and that that position arises from the fact that we don't recognize the existence of the robot. Look, what I mean is, when you leave here, as you're walking along, suddenly try to ask yourself, who is doing the walking? Is it me, or is it my robot? As soon as you've thought that thought, at least the you is asking a question. But the answer to that question is almost certainly that it's the robot who is doing the walking. Now try to imagine that you are walking towards something of incredible importance and that you've got to get there, and now suddenly, using imagination, you can begin to make you take over your walking. And you can do this with absolutely any function. And as soon as you're in that position, you're in a better position for achieving all kinds of things. Demonic possession, if that's what you want, and Taoistic relaxation, if that's what you want, but the recognition that you are behind things, you're in charge. No, simply because uh, while you're thinking in these terms of something else doing it, you're thinking in terms of you being the passive one and something else acting upon you. What I'm trying to say is that if you've put yourself even for a moment in that state that Graham Greene achieved when he pulled the trigger and there was just a click, you suddenly recognize that you are in charge. Now, it's not at all difficult to actually do this continually. I, for example, I always take advantage of train journeys to do it. Staring out of the window, you have to turn your face away from other people because you tend to pull faces. 
but it does work perfectly well. Years ago, some old chap called Brownlow wrote to me and said, did I realise that the face is the gearbox of the soul? He said, you notice that when a child is concentrating on doing a piece of writing, he pulls a face and pulls in the muscles of his forehead and thrusts out his lips. And that all these things are a sort of method of achieving a self-control. And he said, one should deliberately use the face for this purpose. And in fact, nothing works so well. Um, it's almost as good as Russian roulette. When I was in Japan once, I was looking at a series of horrific-looking demons in a Buddhist temple. And some Buddhist priest was explaining to us that, in fact, these were supposed to be, you know, demons from the nether world. But it was perfectly obvious to me that he was wrong. These demons were all sitting cross-legged. What they were was monks pulling faces with total concentration, attempting to get above themselves, so to speak. Use the face as a gearbox. That's the first step. Sorry, I don't quite understand that one. Do you think there's a reason besides just fatigue, which is the only one you've mentioned, that people might go around in the robotic state, oh, yeah. which is trying to reduce yeah. negative, the level of negative stimuli? Well, um, in fact, far more general, the real reason for the robotic state is a kind of boredom, the feeling that the external world is not all that interesting and that therefore you're just trying to get through the day, so to speak, as quickly as possible. Um, I recognize whenever I'm being forced to do something that's purely routine, oddly enough, I saw this very clearly when I was duplicating my book on Alistair Crowley, and I knew that I'd just got to duplicate 200 pages, and I was thinking in a bored sort of way, there's two hours gone out of my life, and then suddenly I realized how stupid this was. And I proceeded to concentrate like mad, give absolutely full attention to every page. And within about five minutes, suddenly I was duplicating with an in immense feeling of doing something really worthwhile. And suddenly in control of my consciousness. Recognizing that, for example, if this duplicating machine now broke down so that I couldn't duplicate it, I would feel madly frustrated and irritated and be forced to get people to come in and repair it or forced to hire another duplicating machine and so on. And the sudden recognition that the mere fact that the duplicating machine had not broken down was in itself a cause for enormous congratulation. And as soon as I felt that, as I say, I began to do it with true concentration. Now, I do that all the time when I'm stuck with routine things that I don't really want to do. The recognition that it's a waste to pour away your ta time down a drain, standing there doing it in a bored frame of mind. You may as well push yourself up to this extreme and then suddenly get this feeling of significance. I tell you, what interests me very deeply is the paradox which is involved in this kind of thing. Um, about um, five years ago in England, we had a tragedy in which a ferry left Calais with its ferry doors open, its car doors open. It's called the Herald of Free Enterprise. And an enormous wave came in and the ferry sank with an enormous loss of life. Now, it wasn't supposed to leave port with its doors open. It was against the law. And at the time, I found myself thinking, my God, if I'd actually been there, wouldn't it have been pleasant to go to the captain and say, look, you're about to leave port. If you do, I'm going to report you and you'll be in deep trouble. And then he would have closed the doors and all this tragedy would have been avoided. And then it struck me that the paradox would be that the people on board would not know that any tragedy had been averted and would get off the ferry, sort of feeling rather yawny and fed up with the journey, the recognition that there's a paradox in life going smoothly, that we fail to recognize that it could go very badly indeed, and that therefore we're perpetually in a state of total freedom. We're perpetually immensely lucky. You know, like this young mother that Maslow mentioned as having a peak experience, when she was watching her husband and children e eating breakfast, and suddenly a beam of sunlight came in through the window, and she thought, my God, aren't I lucky? and went into the peak experience. Now, she was lucky before the beam of sunlight came in through the window, but the beam of sunlight...
in a thousand possible disasters have not taken place, we would actually feel the whole time we were walking down a noisy street with too much traffic and the smell of exhaust, a feeling of absolute ecstasy. Yeah, to a very large extent. And I'm um, sure pointed this out in Man and Superman. He said, you know, um, if we'd actually foreseen all this, would we have created civilization, which is actually made as lazy and neurotic and all the rest of it? Um, what you've got to do if you decide to create civilization is to decide that it really is worth the tremendous effort it's going to cost you. But moreover, that once you've actually done it, you are not going to be bored with what you've done. That's far more important than actually creating civilization recognizing it in advance that you've done something that which is so worthwhile that now the responsibility is on you to pull yourself up to a higher level. Now, as I say, Graham Greene achieved it by pulling a trigger, but we can actually achieve it by recognizing that it is true that we are immensely lucky. What I found myself doing as a kind of discipline years ago was trying to imagine as clearly as possible some sort of disaster. And as I got quite good at imagining disasters, you know, particularly on my walk in the afternoon when I'm pretty tired, I've done a hard day's writing and I take my dogs for a walk on the cliff. What I would do was try to remember Graham Greene and the Russian let and actually try to imagine me pointing a gun at my head and pulling the trigger. And it wouldn't work. And then I'd try it again and again and again until gradually I'd got myself out of this state of being mechanical. And it was then one day when I was walking on the cliff that I suddenly realized that Howard Miller was completely correct. When he wrote me this stuff about the unit of pure thought, I'd written back to him and said, it's very interesting, but all you've done is to rediscover the idea of the transcendental ego, which Kant had invented, you know, that we've got a real self inside us. And then that day when I was walking along the cliff, <clears throat> making these tremendous efforts to get myself out of a state of boredom, and it actually worked. And then I find myself thinking, what in me did it? What inside me has suddenly caused me to be grateful for my existence instead of taking it for granted? Is it the deep unconscious mind? You know, is it my solar plexus or whatever? And I thought hard, and I thought, no, it's none of those things. It's the ordinary Colin Wilson, the everyday me. And then it suddenly struck me, my God, how am Miller's right about the unit of pure thought? We don't need to get the cooperation of the unconscious mind and all the rest of it. The ordinary, everyday self is capable of doing it. And Jung, at the end of his life, believing in the unconscious mind and in Freudian psychology and all the rest of it, suddenly, in fact, changed his point of view completely and began to believe that the, the will of the individual is the most important thing in keeping us psychologically healthy. Very intense, it does lead to some experience. 
but it seems to me it's a temporary experience. So it's a nice, like, skillful means to get out of that state that you spoke about, but I don't think that's the state of, of enlightenment or the state that, that we want like, like to be in a, in a continuous way. While the state of mindfulness, of just having continuous attention, not in that unnatural, concentrated, muscular type of way, you know, so the, because the thing is, like every time I've done that concentrating, like even on an emotional way, I can get myself to have some experience. But it's really temporary. You know, it's like even, you know, like like suddenly, like my face will relax, and I'll feel, you know, it's a very like nice thing. But if something negative comes along, I could be like knocked out of it like that. So that's not the kind of enlightenment I'm um, looking for. So could you say something about about the ego or the idea that I am in control, as opposed to just being mindful or attentive in a, in a continuous way? Well, it seems to me to be a very simple problem. Um, I've never particularly liked Buddhism, simply because the essence of Buddhism seems to me to be extremely negative. Remember, the, the Buddha, um, as a child, sees a, 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 an old man and a sick man and a dead man, <clears throat> and he's told that that is all perfectly normal, and decides that what we have to do is to withdraw from existence to get away from pain, and then devises this method of not involving yourself in your own life. And it seems to me that the Buddhist notion of, that you are not behind things and that you are not doing them seems to me equally fallacious. Um, but I must confess, I have a total blind spot about Buddhism. I, I really detest it. But uh, what does seem to me to be extremely simple is this. There is one thing that is true of all of us, absolutely everyone, and that is that we all experience a strong desire to get out of past states into a, a state of more maturity of some kind of personal evolution that is common to absolutely everybody. And what also seems clear to me is that you reach a point where you stick and it's very difficult to get past that sticking state. Um, when you're attempting any kind of personal evolution, um, Uspensky is a good example. Um, he obviously reached a very high stage and then suddenly found that he could go no further and ended his life as a miserable alcoholic who declared that the method had been a total mistake. And it's this business of sticking somewhere that seems to me um, to be the dangerous point. Now, what seems to me to be the fundamental answer, what was wrong with Uspensky was that his whole outlook was basically Buddhistic, negative. Um, for example, he liked telling Gurdjieff's story that human beings are really like sheep who've been hypnotized by a magician into thinking that everything is okay, that um, the magician really loves them, and that when they die they'll all go to heaven, when actually the magician has every intention of killing them and eating them. And Gurdjieff said, we've got to wake up. Now, the problem was that Uspensky, with his basically negative outlook, stuck. He was unable to get any higher. It seems to me to be absolutely fundamental what is necessary above everything else is a basic feeling of optimism, which Uspensky did not have. But the Buddha, you know, like, like Buddhism has it, it isn't this pessimistic religion, and, and, and that is really a deep misunderstanding of it. It, 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 it isn't a negating thing, it, it's uh, really like hmm? seeing you know, like what things are, and, and it really leads to total, total like freedom and bliss. It isn't a state of deadness and non-reactivity. I'm not suggesting it is, no. It's mm. just the opposite. You know, so I don't believe, you know, like Ospensky might have said that or believe it, I don't think that's what Buddhism is about. Okay, well, let's leave Buddhism out for yeah. the time being. <laughs> Obviously, I, I don't sympathize with Buddhism, and uh, I've had this argument endlessly. But what I am trying to say is fairly simple and straightforward. I find that if I can put myself into a state of ordinary optimism, peak experience, then no matter how tired I am at the end of a day's work, I can go for a walk with that little center of glowing optimism gradually getting wider and wider. I'm not very good at it. I, it, it takes quite an amount of self-control to allow it to do that and not simply to think about your walk and about all the other things. But it does seem to me that the one thing I've learned and I'm now 65 and I've been writing for 40 years, the one thing I've learned over those years is that what is most fundamental is that basic sense of optimism.
which and everything is basically okay. Once you've placed yourself in that state, then everything expands from it. That's why Yeats, at the end of the poem about the Chinaman, says that they're looking down on this miserable, tragic scene, and yet their eyes, their ancient glittering eyes, are gay. <laughs> well, I, d I don't really know. I, I grabbed myself a nice quiet girl when I was 20 or 22. And uh, the result is that, uh, you know, I, I've, I've never sort of really experienced this problem because I adore my wife, I adore my family, and I can concentrate on my work. And that's what seems to me necessary for me personally. Yeah, well, it does seem to me that um, he's probably the greatest man of the 20th century, uh, maybe, you know, many centuries. Uh, it seems to me that he's gone miles beyond anyone else, and that he's done this because his approach is, in a sense, so logical. Gur Gurdjieff, or he, he himself called it Gurdjieff, I'm sure he couldn't pronounce it. Did you join a Gurdjieff group? No, no, never. No. I discovered when I was um, 19 Uspensky's In Search of a Miraculous, which has only just appeared. I'd al already looked through All and Everything, which had appeared the year before and couldn't make head or tail of that. I was delighted to find a straightforward exposition of this. In a sense, it was the most important intellectual experience of my life. And still, this seems to me to be the basically important insight. Gurdjieff recognized that enormous efforts are required, but in point of fact, the enormous efforts are never, ever lost. That feeling I got, as I said, when the car broke down, that feeling that, as it were, it was almost somebody saying to me when I said, suppose this car broke down, it didn't really do any harm. I mean, you know, I got home 20 minutes late. But the fact remains that I got a strange feeling of a meaning out there almost of beings out there. And it seems to me that our main problem as human beings is to recognize that not only are, are our lives not meaningless, but there's something outside us which, if we cooperate with it, everything suddenly becomes meaningful. What goes wrong all springs from this feeling that we are alone and that we're struggling away against a world that doesn't understand us and doesn't appreciate us and so on. That seems to me to be the kind of thing that made Van Gogh commit suicide, writing, misery will never end. As soon as you recognize, as Van Gogh obviously did, when he painted The Starry Night, that in some funny way there's something out there. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about optimism. That what, you are act what I actually do when I go on my walk is, as it were, to open myself, and something comes in from outside which is already there, and proceeds to recharge my batteries. Gurdjieff said there's an immense source of external energy, which any of us can draw upon merely by wanting to, and that if you can't draw upon it yourself, you can get somebody else who understands it, he meant himself, obviously, and do it through them. Now, in point of fact, everybody can do it themselves, because it's there. We've merely got our backs to it, and if you can actually just get that basic feeling of sort of basic optimism that everything is okay, what I'm trying to say is that two centuries of culture have become increasingly pessimistic until at the moment we're living in an age where, for example, it would be impossible to win the Nobel Prize if you're an optimist, that all of the writers of this century have been basically gloomy and pessimistic and to me, it seems to be a sign of the sheer stupidity of our age that we could give the Nobel Prize to someone like Samuel Beckett, who is explaining that life is totally miserable and meaningless <clears throat> and that we better give up the struggle. What I'm trying to do is to reverse this tendency, and it can only be done through individuals like the individuals here this evening. 
oh, how can this optimism reconcile itself to the thought of one's death? I don't know. I don't suppose I've ever really bothered about um, this particular question, although um, that's not for any religious reason. But on the other hand, um, when I was finally asked to write a book about life after death and did it very reluctantly, I did come to the conclusion that the evidence for life after death is so overwhelmingly powerful that on the whole, you know, this is not a problem that seems worth worrying about. On the other hand, I don't feel that um, it's very important to think about, you know, that what seems to me to be a fact that there is life after death, it's just not important. It doesn't matter. What, what matters is being here and now. And if, as it were, you die without recognizing how important it is to be here and now, breaking through to a kind of total optimism without the conviction of life after death, then you've, then you've failed and have to do it all over again. Just one more, I think. Mm. Can I name some science fiction books where the author has the same kind of um, feeling as me? Um, wh what I would say is that in a lot of science fiction, um, for example, in um, the works of Olaf Stapledon, uh, there is a basic feeling of optimism, and that in the works, for example, of um, Van Vogt, there's a continual obsession with the fact that people are a lot stronger than they realize. Nearly always in Van Vogt's stories, you get this feeling that people throw off what they consider to be themselves and discover themselves to be gods or supermen. That kind of myth seems to me to be immensely important. And unfortunately, there aren't enough people like Stapledon and Van Vogt. 